Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Institute for Government. My name is Peter Riddle. I'm the director here. Um, it's wonderful to have the kind of hush before everything begins. I mean, you don't even have to strike up the overture before we, we begin. I'm delighted. Um, uh, this is, in a sense, a third in the series of very interesting events we've had here in the last week. We had Michael Fallon's Defence Secretary, then John Brown, um, the outgoing, he's now ex-government lead Ned, and now we've got John Manzoni, um, a former colleague of John Brown's, um, uh, a VP in the energy sector. Um, and John um, is, has, um, it's only a year since you've joined government, actually, um, in total. Less. Uh, less, um, <laughs> what it feels like is another question. Um, and John um, ran the major project authority for seven or eight months. And is now the occupant of the first role of Chief Executive of the Civil Service. So when he was appointed, um, I said, would he like to come here um, to talk about what the job involves? Because it's a challenging job. The job definition, job description, job definition was a subject of some controversy and, and, and dispute. And also because trying to pull things together at the centre, a topic which the Institute for Government has been very involved in over the last few years, involves challenges from departments, involves challenges in defining exactly what can be achieved from the centre. And I know from conversation with John, he's got some very specific ideas based on his long experience in business and having worked in Whitehall and with Whitehall um, on exactly how reform can be achieved, what needs to happen in reform. And so um, uh, John's going to set out um, what he's trying to achieve um, 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 as Chief Executive of the Civil Service at this particularly interesting time now we're, we're, we're just ahead of the election and then we'll have a short period for, for questions afterwards and seeing the audience around here I'll try and ensure as many of the questions can possible come from the audience which I know is very interested and involved in a number of these topics. John Manzoni. <laughs> Thanks Peter. Well it's a pleasure to be here. I, I, uh, I've got this long prepared and rather formal speech here. Um, but anyway, it's great to be at the Institute of Government, and, I, and, and what I, I will do that. I'm going to outline what I'm trying to achieve as the Chief Executive of the Civil Service. And, you know, what is that, you may ask. Um, and I must say, I'm, I'm a little, and I'll, I'll try and give you my priorities. I'm being a bit selfish because, of course, um, if I can outline it to you lot, then with any luck, you can help me do it, uh, depending on whether, I guess, you agree with what I'm saying or not. But I'm hopeful that if I say anything half sensible, you'll be able to help me do what I need to do. Because for sure, the first lesson that I've learned in Whitehall is that I can't do it myself. Um, as Peter said, I've been a, um, a, a civil servant for about a year, three or four months only in this role. Before that, I was at the Major Projects Authority and used that period to, to uh, make some observations um, uh, and, and it certainly informed uh, the way that I've structured the agenda that I've set out now for the Chief Executive's role. Um, uh, and I would say before I start that everything that I say tonight is through a lens around implementation and delivery. That is the only value that somebody like me can bring to a role like this. I, I've not spent my life in Whitehall in policy, but I have spent my life in large, complicated organisations getting things done. So what have I observed? Well, the first thing that I've observed um, is that civil servants are incredibly bright and incredibly intelligent. Um, in fact, I have observed and said several times that, on average, uh, the civil service has a far higher intelligence quota than the private sector. That is something I stand by. It is an observation. And I often find myself marvelling at the rather erudite papers that I read or listening to the history uh, in depth of something or other uh, as somebody expounds on something that, you know, is completely uh, fascinating and very, very impressive. And the fact is that we're still attracting the brightest and the best. We're still attracting the very brightest graduates into the civil service, and that's a fantastic place to start. But I have to say I think we miss an opportunity because what I don't see in the civil service is those same really fantastic graduates 20 years later having spent... 20 years uh, delivering and growing and gaining the experience in delivering the really complicated things that government has to deliver. They don't bu build, therefore, the deep-rooted experience and judgment about what it takes to really deliver really, really complicated projects. Of course, there are exceptions, but I do not see that same level of graduate 20 years later in that mode. 
And the reason it's important is because the sort of judgment that, that it takes to deliver complicated projects actually comes only from years of experience. Uh, it, it, it takes actually doing it. it, doesn't, it it's much more than just conceptualising it. And that's why this is so important. My second observation is that it is one busy place. Uh, there's a huge amount of delivery going on every day. Not only is the civil service doing what the civil service does, but it's also transforming itself at the same time. So we're flying a complicated plane to fly, and we're transforming it at the same time. And that is a big ask for anybody. And the reality is that's going to continue, if not accelerate and deepen, uh, as we go into the next period. And I've said before that there's about, uh, to the average observer, to somebody coming in from the outside, there's about 30% more activity than would be sensibly uh, stepped into with the available resources, uh, uh, or that those available resources can easily handle. And that, of course, is the challenge, because in order to square that circle, we've got to make some fundamental ways, some fundamental changes to the ways that we actually go about our work. I don't want to leave the wrong impression. It is a challenge, but in equal measure, it's actually the opportunity that stands before us. A third ob observation to uh, uh, somebody who spent their life in the corporate world is that the government is actually remarkably unjoined up. Um, perhaps I wasn't looking, or perhaps I was naive, probably both, uh, but I was surprised when I arrived just how unjoined up government actually is. Of course, over time, I'm learning about the complexities involved and why it is as it is. But an important role uh, of newcomers like me is to point out some of those things, some of these things to those for whom this is just the norm. The fact is, the future will demand a greater degree of collaboration. Collaboration between the departments to share common ways of doing things and collaboration between the centre and the departments in order to create a more optimal output. And without that, frankly, we stand little chance of meeting the fiscal challenges of the next period. Everybody I talk to recognises it, it's just that they're not very well practised in it. And I'll make one final observation before moving on, and that's to do with the whole issue of leadership, confidence, boldness and taking risks. And I think this is perhaps uh, a very complex area. Is the civil service risk averse? Are civil servants people in grey suits, and hence mostly male, I find myself in a grey suit this evening, uh, who spend their time obfuscating and trying to avoid accountability. As I've said, it is a complex issue, and of course it's related to culture, the system, and what's gone on before. What I can tell you is that the people with whom I interact daily are not like that. They're incredibly hardworking, and they have a very, very impressive public service ethos. But there's no doubt that the system is designed in many ways to slow things down, and that's especially true when compared to the environment I'm more used to in business. The system is intellectually rigorous and evidence-based and, yes, less accountable. Business relies more on judgment and does tend to hold sharper accountability. The fact that I'd never actually, this audience might smile, the fact that I'd never used or heard the term evidence-based before I arrived in Whitehall might surprise you. It tells you something. And, of course, over time, the system becomes the people and vice versa, so there's a complex interrelationship here. It's probably right, on reflection, that the public sector system should be designed to prevent maverick risk. But I do think it leaves the dilemma as to how we encourage big leaders to take accountability for big things in that system. I'm convinced that if there's anywhere that we need big leaders, it's in the public sector. What is being done every day is very difficult, and it needs that kind of leadership. So enough on observations, but partly because in making them there's a danger of obscuring the fantastic progress that has been made over the last four years. There's no question that we've begun the journey. The civil service is now smaller than any time since the Second World War. 80,000 people fewer than four years ago deliver, delivering ever better public services. We've reduced our footprint of buildings two million square feet and it's one of the most diverse work workforces I've ever worked in. 53.5% of the staff are women, and 38% are women in senior grades. Over 10% of staff have BME backgrounds, and nearly 9% have a declared disability. And across the whole service, over the last few years, every measure of diversity we currently use has improved. 
We've begun to utilise and experiment with different business models for delivering public services. It doesn't have to be all completely within the civil service. Today, there are 100 mutuals now spun out from the public sector, and that's more than... There were nine in 2010. They cover about £1.5 billion pounds of services, ranging from community health cares to libraries to children's services. More services are being di delivered digitally. They're not only cheaper, but they're faster, they're simpler, and they're more convenient to use. And the UK can genuinely claim to be a world leader in digital government. The main government platform, gov.uk, has reduced over 300 websites to a single one, and it's already saving taxpayers about £60 million pounds a year. And we're now building on that by introducing gov.uk Verify. This is a fast way and a secure way to prove who you are online. It's a completely new concept and it's the first of its kind in the world. We're very close to completing the first wave of 25 exemplar online services kicked off at the start of this parliament. They'll help to save about £1.3 billion a year after the next general election. They're faster, more convenient for users and more cost effective. Just as an example, one million people used the new independent electoral registration service in the two months after it went live. We've strengthened critical skills across government. We'll have 300 people through the world-class project leadership programme by the end of this parliament, and we have a similar programme for commercial skills. We've appointed 17 Crown commercial representatives to begin to represent government's interests in the big strategic commercial relationships that we hold. We're developing new career paths for commercial, technical and digital professionals across government. And so these are just a few of the achievements which have been delivered from the reform agenda which has been put in place and run by many leaders over many years. Most recently, of course, it's been championed at the ministerial level by Francis Maud, who had the courage and the determination to see them through to success. It was a brave thing to do and it was the right thing to do. And I'm under no illusion that it's been easy but it was the shock that the system needed to start to change. Francis has told me about a comment someone made to him in the past, that he was necessary but not sufficient. And I wanted to put it on record that Francis himself is quite clear that being necessary but not sufficient isn't good enough. He wants to be unnecessary as well. Uh, and I believe he should be unnecessary. In fact, with the weekend news, I think it's a good job he is unnecessary. Um, the civil service should not need Francis Moore to reform itself. We need to do it to ourselves. We need now to take these early successes, we need to build the momentum for the civil service to meet the challenges for the next phase. The next phase needs to be defined, it needs to be delivered and driven by us. We should not, and we do not, need anybody else to tell us what to do. That's what leadership is about, and I believe the leadership of the civil service is starting to realise that, it is up for it today. So how do we take that progress and make it deep, embedded and sustainable? Much of the previous phase was about showing a different way, but the system somehow felt done too, which of course is not sustainable in the long run. We need the system to do it to itself. Many people have already pointed out to me that this isn't new, that people have been here before, probably standing in front of you saying the same thing. Implicit and occasionally explicit in, explicit in their comments is, why will you be any different, mate? You know, many have tried this before. But I think there is actually a difference now. And it's not primarily what I do. My role is to bring together the context and set the conditions so that the system can do it for itself. First, the fiscal context. And I've already made the point that this is both the greatest imperative and the greatest opportunity. <coughs> We've set a goal that we want to deliver around £10 billion of efficiencies by 2017-18 and a goal of between £15 and £20 billion by 2020. Of course the money's there if we really go after it, but it will take brave decisions, both politically and administratively. It's no good assuming people can just work harder and harder. We'll need to make some fundamental changes in how we work if we're going to achieve those goals. Secondly, from the Job Centre staff to the Permanent Secretaries, I actually believe the Civil Service is up for it. We may not know exactly how to do it, and that's what we're working on, but they're willing. And without their support and leadership, it just won't happen. It's not something which can be affected purely by diktat or prescription from the top. I visited teams on the front line of public service delivery, from the young offenders institutions to job centres to procurement officers in Liverpool. In each place I visit, the teams are dedicated, hard-working and completely engaged in improving the service they provide. It's very impressive and they're very proud of their work. 
and none of them shirk from the difficult trade-offs that they have to make every day to deliver their service with fewer and fewer resources. And they do all this maintaining fantastic relationships with the people they serve. I can see it and I can feel it. But somehow that feeling gets lost somewhere because the civil service as a whole has a reputation for being less than the sum of its parts. Individuals on the front line are doing unbelievable work. So why does the civil service put up with a reputation for being less than that? My hope is that by owning and taking forward an agenda to improve delivery, the civil service as a whole will reflect the completely incredible work being delivered every day on the front line. We do many things really, really well. We can certainly improve some things, and that's what this is about. Let's think about this as adding strings to the bow. It also gives us a clue about how I believe we should go about it. It's not about pulling everything up by the roots, because that is not what is needed. Of course we have to define a comprehensive agenda for change, and to change those things which have to be changed. But much has been put in place, and we have to build on what has been started. For my part, it's about being just enough of an outsider to know when and how to challenge. I have to be just enough of the grit in the oyster. Too little, and nothing happens, too much, and I'll probably get neutered and blocked, and I won't even notice it had happened. So those judgments, from my perspective, are absolutely critical. I think of this whole change of more, more as an accelerating evolution than a revolution. And it won't happen overnight. We need to set in place systemic change, which is sustaining, and at the same time, delivering real progress to show that momentum. But the prize is worth it. We've already seen a glimpse of what might be possible. The future will be defined by more digital services, which improve customer experience and at the same time are significantly cheaper to, do, to provide. The public can interact with the government when they want and it works. We need to make it as easy and quick to renew your passport or apply for an apprenticeship as it is to book a holiday or order your shopping. We need to be much more intelligent and strategic buyers of outside services. We need our commercial arrangements to encourage the very best of the market innovation and risk taking. We need to hold the market much more effectively to account and I have to tell you that the market will relish that. We've begun to create shared services and central buying power but we're right at the start. Every commercial organisation of scale does these things and reaps enormous benefits. We've been slow, partly due to a rather halting implementation but the future has to include such obvious examples of scale economies because the prize is so substantial. And over time, we need to look beyond Whitehall, beyond central government and to the wider public sector. Those same skills and scale economies, the same requirement to be better buyers, all translate into the wider public sector. So over time, we have to have our eyes on that too. So finally, to my agenda. I've set four main areas of focus for the Chief Executive. They're informed by everything I've told you so far, and they're completely aligned with the Cabinet Secretary's priorities on digital, commercial and diversity. First, and at the heart of everything, is people. I'm not the first to observe that the civil service seems not to have taken the development of its people as seriously as the corporate world. I cannot emphasise enough the importance of taking this seriously. Of course it takes time, and therefore, perhaps particularly in the civil service, it falls victim to the urgent trumping the important. But this is something we cannot afford to compromise. The good news is that we've started to make progress. The mechanisms of talent management, training and development, high potential schemes, and managing the, se the senior ranks centrally are all in place and we're beginning to breathe life into those mechanisms. That's great and it's a very important, although relatively recent, development. What's not in place yet is that if I'm a young graduate who wants to learn about delivery, there is currently no clear career path for me in the civil service. There has been a sense that delivery can be left to others while the really important people do policy. This is also changing, but it's not changing fast enough. We need to create professions and real careers for those who wish to learn about delivery. Government does really hard things, and we ask very bright generalists to do them. And the blunt truth is that that doesn't always work very well. I've explained why, and that's because delivery takes judgment born of years of experience, not just intellectual smarts. 
There's no reason at all why we can't create career paths to train world-class delivery skills. We have the best sweet shop in the country in terms of operation, op opportunities, and we have the best raw material to work with. We need to take our talented young people and build experienced leaders with excellent judgment and confidence who can transform, lean, lead, motivate and deliver all at the same time. And that is some kind of skill. And we haven't got the structures in place yet to create those people, and now we need them. There are other related aspects of this. Our human resource policies don't enable this to happen very easily. We've trouble attracting the right people, sometimes because we can't pay them enough, sometimes because we don't create a clear proposition for them, and sometimes because we don't act with the full power and weight of the UK government. So we need to refine our human resource policies and structures to make sure that they're as aligned as possible with our workforce strategy. So first on the agenda, people and skills. Second, and related to what I've said about people, is the creation of functions at the centre of government. Here I mean finance, human resources, technology, commercial procurement and the like. We need to evolve the centre of government to one which contains strong core functions. And there are several very good reasons for this. First, we need to build capability, as I've described. We could leave that to each department, but it's far more powerful to do it centrally. That doesn't mean building capability only at, this, only at the centre. In fact, quite the opposite. But the power of the UK government as a whole, providing a career path for young people or hiring experienced veterans into specific opportunities, is greater than each department doing it for itself. So an early task for the functions is to build distributed capability. We've started and it's already making a difference. But there's another reason. We've reached the point where we need to reach across departmental boundaries to create synergy across government as a whole. Why have 23 payment systems doing the same thing when we could do it once and share? Why don't we rationalise our offices and optimise the use of the multiple buildings we have across government? Why wouldn't we significantly scale up our central buying power and develop sophisticated category strategies just as the private sector do? And of course there is no reason not to, and that's why we've started. It takes time and these functions need some mechanisms of, of influence until the system is used to working more collaboratively and capabilities are built. So we should maintain existing control mechanisms with a view to evolving them to a more standards-based approach. We've begun to create a functional model at the heart of government to develop those cross-government strategies delivered through the departmental agendas and bring the benefits I've described and many more over time. So second on the agenda is creating powerful functions. Third is what I call performance management. For a system which delivers so much, we don't yet have a well-developed performance management culture. I'm talking here about mechanisms which performance manage outcomes and which at the same time reinforce and clarify accountabilities. That's not to say that they don't exist, but we would certainly benefit from making them more systematic. It may be because the complexities of delivery and implementation are not as inherently understood as the challenges of policy formulation in the first place. Or it may be that once the idea is set, the system tends to move on to the next idea, assuming that implementation can just happen. But for whatever reason, we need to build the capacity and experience to manage performance once we've set something in train. Any delivery, of course, begins with a clear plan and set of objectives. The fact that up until recently some permanent secretaries had up to 100 items on their list of accountable objectives tells us something isn't right. We need big people doing big things. Nobody can deliver 100 big things. So for this part of the agenda it's about strategic prioritisation, getting clear on what really matters and then holding people accountable for those, for those things. And finally perhaps most difficult is leadership and allied to that confidence. I've already said that we're transforming the plane at the same time as trying to fly it, and it's a difficult plane to fly. The demands on leadership in those circumstances are high. No one should assume that this is easy. It's one of the most complex environments I've experienced, but in the context of delivery, one role of leadership is to absorb that complexity and make it as simple as possible for those below. To do that, we have to make judgments about what is or is not possible. We have to be clear about the timeframes for delivering whatever it is that we're signing up to. And as I've emphasised this evening, that takes experience. And from that experience comes confidence. 
The civil service is really doing really very difficult things and we need strong, confident leaders to do it. Somehow, I feel we've allowed ourselves to be placed a little on the back foot. It hasn't helped that we've allowed others to dictate what needs to change in the civil service. That certainly puts us on the back foot. If we're not in control of our own destiny, then it's not surprising that we don't project confidence. But I do sense a change. I believe that the leadership of the civil service today is up for getting back on the front foot. They are ready to own and drive the agenda for what comes next. I sincerely hope they are, because I know that without them, I certainly can't deliver what I've described for you this evening. The exact details of how we move forward on the priorities I've outlined are, of course, not completely defined. Why would they be? But, but the important thing is that I'm seeing collaboration among the leaders to define it. My role is to galvanise that, to harness the momentum, and in so doing, build a more confident, front-footed leadership which is absolutely in control of its own destiny. Several of my friends have asked me why on earth I've chosen to do this. I hope tonight I've shared a little of the excitement and the possibility that this new role brings, and that's actually why I'm here. And I meant what I said at the beginning. I need all the help I can get. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, wow, you've got a big job there. Um, one th um, phrase you used several times was about big leaders and the need for big leaders. But you operate in a political environment. How is it possible to have big leaders within the civil service when you've got ministers who regard themselves as leaders? I think it's a state of mind, apart from that. Well, I mean, it's a very interesting question. I, um, there is no question that the civil service, there's 450,000 people in the central government of the civil service. Um, it doesn't get much bigger than that in any leadership role. I'm not sure you need uh, uh, to worry about what is happening. I mean, of course you need to worry about it, but actually we need to do more of absorbing that as leaders and actually creating clarity for those below. I, have, I think we have a tendency to sort of let it all come through. We have a tendency to have 450,000 people looking up waiting for the next instruction. Mm. We need more front-footedness. We need more uh, confidence in what it is that civil service is building and doing incredibly hard things. Uh, an organisation this scale, of this complexity, cannot do that looking upwards. It has to look forwards. It has to look straight ahead and it has to be clear about what it is that it's got to do. Um, so I think, uh, and I think that the system, as I suggested, as I hinted, I think the system does actually put many uh, mechanisms in place which, uh, which stop bold action. They're actually designed to stop bold action. And I think on reflection it's probably right, I don't have an answer for this, it's probably right that the system should stop bold action because it can't afford to have mistakes. But the question in that is, if, you, if you're not aware of that, then actually what happens is it just, people get used to it. And then stop, bold action, big leadership stops happening. Because actually, you can't do it anyway. Well, it's just the way it is. And the question is, how do we square, how do we get at that dilemma where the system by design is there to stop it? And actually, the tasks at hand need real accountability, real boldness, real leadership, and yet everything in the system is there to stop you doing that. And actually, if you're not careful, and, and, and if you're not careful, you just exhaust everybody, and over time, the system just settles into that mode. And that's the essence, of, I think, at the core of the dilemma. But some of that is because of the political environment, the accountability environment imposed by parliament and so on. And it's very difficult for you to say to civil service leaders, well, look forward, don't look up, when they, when they got the uh, Public Accounts Committee to face? Just people like you and me, Peter. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, no, I think that, I mean, look, the, the civil service is here to serve the government of the day. Let's be very clear about that. I mean, that's, so that's why, that is why, and that's why this is especially difficult, yeah. because this environment for the senior leadership of the civil service is actually more challenging because of that than the equivalent in the private sector. It is more challenging because the because of the exogenous changes that happen, because sometimes things can change very quickly. 
All of that has to be... But that's why we actually need even better, even more experience, even strong. And I think that... I mean, I'm not... The, the leadership of the civil service is really... is, is very, very accomplished. Uh, particularly, actually, at dealing with that. Mm. The accomplishment in dealing with that, what I'm talking about is adding some extra skills. They're tremendous. I've never, I mean, they're very, very good at dealing with that changing environment. What, but, but actually, as a result of being so good at that, with that muscle, we're not very good at the other muscle. Mm. My job is to stand over here and say, hang on a minute, come over here. There's, there's some things over here we need to attend to, mm. to add to that muscle. That is a, I know it's a tough call, but there's no question, in my view, joining this civil service, that uh, we could be even better if we developed that muscle a little more. Yeah, one of the other themes, and I've heard you talk about it before, in developing the professions, particularly on the delivery side, you said very vividly, for, for a graduate coming in, in their 20s, there isn't an obvious career path for delivery as opposed to being a private secretary right. and doing all the familiar policy jobs. How do you develop that? I, mean, oh, I think it's not difficult to put in place. I mean, I really, you know, it's very odd to me. And I think it's, it, maybe it's, been, I mean, we've written it down in the reform. Mm. We just haven't done it yet. Um, so <coughs> I think we have a very strong policy profession. We have a very strong economist profession. We have a very strong analytic profession. We do not have a commercial profession. We don't have a digital profession. We don't have a project leadership profession. And actually, when you think about it, since... The future of, 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 of how government acts is now increasingly at an interface with the commercial market. Uh, we absolutely need people who can grow over years the experience in those kind of delivery professions. So we're already doing it. It's not difficult to do. You've just got to stand in the place, got to define a function leader, got to ask that function leader to create career paths for people. And actually, if you're a 25-year-old and you want to go and build things or you want to come and uh, work on IT or you want to come and work on digital, where better than the government to do it? We have, as I say, we have the biggest and the best sweet shop of any. You, you'll have a way more interesting, varied career. Uh, and, you know, the, the pay might be an issue, but not for years. Um, and so there's, there's, a, there's a massive opportunity to have people coming in, young people, and having them build that experience. And this is, this is quite a hard thing, because I look at really great people Terribly, you know, I mean, I, I've got to be careful here because it's one thing to assimilate, well, yeah, that seems pretty <coughs> sensible, that project. That's, quite, that's one thing to do on a piece of paper, and you can, bright people can do that. But it's very hard to say to somebody, look, until you've actually lived it and been there, that's a very different thing in mobilising large groups of people toward an objective. Um, we're just not practised enough in that, and that comes from the experience. What about the balance of, I mean, something you touched on also, was the need... You know, given you want to achieve your pr improvements in project management, uh, digital, <coughs> commercial, fairly quickly, of bringing people in as opposed to nurturing the talent you've got? Well, I think we have to do both. Mm. Um, I, th I, th I absolutely, um, uh, you know, you can't just keep bringing them in. Uh, but I think at the, at, you know, at different levels, we have to have different strategies. Mm. I absolutely think we have to start with a fast stream. In fact, actually, I was talking to a group of apprentices this morning, and they were, you know, they, I mean, they come in at the apprentice level or the fast stream at the graduate level, and, and over a few years we can build that. Mm. But actually, we have to sort of spike it all the way up the system, um, and we are doing. You know, there's a lot of, I mean, I can't remember the number, but uh, but I think it's about 25% of the people in the senior civil service grades today are hired from the outside. Um, now, it's not, a, it's not an easy place to immediately come in and make it all work. Um, uh, so some, some of those don't stay, but I think on a, on a, we're being pretty successful at that. And they tend to be in the places that, of course, you know, increasingly we're interfacing with the market. And there's, I mean, I, there's no question that we don't, we, we haven't had the experience inside to be a really, really good client to those people to whom we're outsourcing various functions. And, um, and I have to tell you that if we were, as I said, the market would relish it. They way prefer to have a challenging client than a client that just says, actually, I just want the lowest price and, you know, and, then, and then don't really know how to performance manage. It's a way more productive, challenging, stretching environment. And, and we're not actually there yet. Now, that's where we've got to get to. Yeah, one of the other things you pointed out is an echo of what um, John Brown was saying here last week. Uh, last Wednesday, was the point on people. 
that he was making the point. I mean, you know, you, you <coughs> had the conversation in the past with him, I'm sure, that you know, top leaders need to spend a significant element of their time dealing with people and uh, development of executives. And he was surprised, uh, from his own perspective, uh, um, how relatively little time the civil service did on that. Well, I, and, and I think we're getting better. Uh, as I said, we've put in place all of the mechanisms mm. that I've seen mm. in corporate structures. Mm. Um, we have, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, a central view of the most senior people. We mm. rank them and we performance rank and put them in grids and we look at it. We have high potential schemes. We have senior leadership schemes. I think we haven't quite got them all where we want them yet. Um, we centrally manage the top talent. We do all of the things mm. that, uh, um, uh, that, that you would expect. I would have to say to you that because it's relatively recent, uh, it's not really, I mean, we're, we're breathing life into it, but it's not really established. You know, we don't all know all of the people properly yet. and all, so, so all of that is coming. Uh, but it is absolutely true that, um, uh, you know, we, d we, and I'm not quite sure why this is, uh, but, but lead leaders do not spend as much time as I have seen in other contexts uh, managing, coaching, and being accountable for the development of their, his or her team. That is a fact. And um, until we do, we will not encourage and nurture the sort of people skills that we require. And, and, and it is a, this is complex, and you and I touched mm. on this before, because uh, the leader uh, it, it doesn't always feel completely accountable for everything to do with his or her mm. team, because we have we have different parts of government accountable for different aspects of the human resource system. And that, that's, you've just got to, ex you've got to understand that because in an organiser, in a, in a company, you know, I, would, I used to look to my leaders and they would be fully and wholly accountable for the quality of, for the judgement of who they hired, for the development of those people, all of that stuff. Uh, that's not the case in government and we need to think about how we put more of that back. <coughs> One final thing before opening it up is that it's been the kind of mantra of successive cabinet secretaries, heads of the civil service, um, to say no one will get promoted beyond a certain scale unless they've had um, whatever the description of the time is, delivery experience, practical project experience and so on. And then you've had successive leaders of the civil service whose only experience has been in private office and in, and, and, and in policy experience. And they all say, go and do it. Is that the right approach, even though it's breached into practice, or is it to have the separate to separate out the professions, delivery, project management, um, and so on, rather than to say if you're going to reach the top, you've got to have had that um, project management delivery experience? Because the, the sense that the are you inviting me to be disloyal? Or no, like no, no, no. We're talking about the future, John. We're talking um, about the future. No, look, I think uh, I, it's a debate about whether you separate. But, but actually. Um, uh, I mean, one of the issues has been, well, you need to go and do that so that you can... T but, but there's a bit of a slightly, well, let's go and do that, tick that box, and I'll come back again and do what I'm, you know, really used to. And mm -hmm. my whole point is that if we, if we can take... I don't even mind that if we take a 25-year-old or a 20-year-old and they spend five or seven years in government, they go back out into the private sector, they'll come back. This is interesting enough that people will go backwards and forwards through that. We need more of that going on. Uh, it's not about doing one job and ticking the box. I think mm. it's about uh, learning, you know, over time, having a different s sets of experience. There's no question, uh, you know, and, I, and I've heard various debates on this. Um, but again, I, you know, I'm deliberately, in some senses, quite deliberately standing in a slightly different place. Mm. I need to make it okay for people to say, you know what, actually he's got, so, you know, it's okay. If the chief executive of the civil service can be a guy who really doesn't understand what this policy is all about, then maybe that's okay. Uh, maybe I can stand in that. And it, as, again, this is not, you know, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, you know, it's about how we can get this better. It's about standing in a place and saying, actually, have you thought about it this way? Just enough of the grit. Yeah, and on that, I mean, it's just enough of the grit because you're not a chief executive in the way you were in the private sector. You don't have the permanent secretaries, you have a collaborative, cooperative, whatever you like to describe it, relationship with. They don't, they don't report to you in the conventional They sense. report to their Secretary of State. Yeah, they report to Secretary of State and to some extent to the, camp, the uh, Jeremy Hayward. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is, I mean, I must say, this is what, I mean, like that chap in the PAC, you know, what is the point of view, he mm. said. Mm. 
you know, interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 you've got to be careful what you wish for. I don't actually want everything reported because actually I'm busy enough as it is, you know. Um, uh, if I can't do this uh, through collaboration with the permanent secretaries, um, if I can't do this, uh, um, y you know, there have been all sorts of systems tried in the past. You know, you could be God and actually it still wouldn't make any difference, right? I mean, you've got to think about how this system uh, uh, can change. Leadership is about setting context. Mm. It's not about issuing all the instructions all the time or, you know, as I said to the PAC, it's not, you know, it's not just bish, bash, bosh, right? I mean, it is, it is about setting context. It's amazing if you set the context right, guess what? Intelligent people tend to reach the same conclusions and they move in the same direction. Um, so I don't hanker after, um, uh, you know, all of the levers of power uh, because I think this system is too established you know, you can't really fight the Constitution, which says they all report to their secretaries of state yeah. in the end. You, I mean, I don't think I've got much chance of changing that. Uh, so I think you've got to work with it and figure out how to be most uh, effective within the constraints that there are. Um, it's a very big system. And actually, um, you know, I'm quite content with where we are. Uh, I have the functional agendas. I do believe the functional agendas will become increasingly important. I mean, I tell you now, this system will not deliver what it's, what it's signed up for to deliver unless we change the way we work. It just won't. Well, it might happen. You'll see all sorts of hurt sometime later. All sorts of hurt, because you can't just squeeze the system continuously. Uh, you know, we have multiple systems all over the place. And so there's no question that, that a different way of working has to be central to the next phase. And the only question is, how do we... And it's a very unpracticed mechanism. I mean, we have these, these conversations. It's a very unpracticed mechanism inside the civil service. Um, and so it's a bit clunky. Uh, but I do believe that the leadership today can see the power in that and can see the possibility. And that's basically what I'm relying on. Right, let's open it up to questions. Um, and uh, we'll take a couple at a time. Right at the back, Virginia. And could you identify yourself? Yeah, even Virginia Bottomley. I've spent a few years sort of hanging around Whitehall, um, and I now look for leaders. Uh, John, I'm absolutely thrilled by your comments today. I completely endorse, I like the tone, I like the style, I like the reality. Um, I've got two worries. One endorses your point about leadership. If I'm finding the chief executive of a commercial enterprise, the chairman hasn't got enough time for me. I mean, he's got too much time for me. I can call him any time, any moment. If you're doing a really important government job, you work with a very junior sort of procurement person who's frightened of the permanent secretary, doesn't want to go near them. And I'm always saying, I'm sorry, this is a big job, and the big man needs to hear about this big job. And the poor sort of woman or man is terrified they're going to be fired for going outside their hierarchy. But it is quite extraordinary, the difference between the time spent on being in big people. My, my most difficult problem, though, is that... I can remember a time when Jim Pryor was a member of parliament and he was chairman of GEC. That's extraordinary. I can remember a time when people in parliament had run big trade unions, one of the reasons Alan Johnson was such a good minister. They'd been, <coughs> organ they'd been in the army. They'd organized groups of people. And if you go to local government, the gap between officials and elected members is much, much smaller. Hmm because there are a lot of small businessmen in local government. Everyone in local government, regardless of party, contracts <coughs> out, outsources, and they share their skills. But I am really worried about the nature of people who go into politics. Uh, I know they all do it for their vast 65,000 pounds a year, and so they can massively get their shopping on their expenses, as they're put cynically told, which makes it more grim. But the point is, they have never run anything. They are loners. MPs are loners. and. Uh, in a business, someone like David Sainsbury, Alleluia, David, mm. you know, you'd run a business and you're a good minister. But most of them really, they don't know the level of their ignorance. And if civil servants, sorry, I'll shut up. If civil servants challenge them, they're going to be accused of being disloyal. But how can you educate a new incoming government to be more modest about the skills they bring to the party? Thanks, Jim. Thanks. Well, well, look, just to comment on this, I mean, I, you know, it, it, I mean, it is, 
I, you know, if, if one sort of accepts that as the reality, then it sort of becomes the reality, right? My experience, I have to say, is if I have something to say to a minister, I mean, I, I, I get frustrated sometimes because I look at it and I think, you know, where did that come from? What on earth were you thinking, you know, when that... Um, uh, uh, but actually, in general, if I go and see a minister, I hope... I mean, he, you know, I, they want a real grown-up conversation. And, it, and, and the problem is that if, if you condition civil servants to say, well, you know, you, you know, you got, yes, you know, you've got to do whatever the minister says, I mean, the answer is, bloody grow up. Tell them what it is that you think you can do. And, of course, you can't get to that condition unless you spend 25 years knowing about what it is you're talking to them about. I think that's a really super idea, Minister. You are off your trolley if you think you can do it in that time. And if you want to do it in that time, get somebody else. Because I'm telling you, you can't do it in that time. You need this many people and you do... They will welcome that. I, I honestly believe that. I have to be optimistic, don't I? I mean, I... But I think that's, we need more of those conversations. But, but realistically, you're never going to have a civil servant who will have that conversation. Look, I, I'm uh, okay, okay you, you, we, we, we try to have no, an no, order of questions. Not quite in those well, terms. Well, yeah, no, no, okay, no, no, no. We'll come to you later. Not quite in those terms. No, no. Uh, a, a fair point. We'll come to you later. At the front, David. Uh, just, we're getting the mic. You're getting your mic for you. David Sainsbury. Um, when I became a minister, it was explained to me very early on that um, I was joining a Rolls-Royce machine, uh, which was brilliant at policy. Um, maybe it wasn't quite so good at delivery, but it was brilliant at policy. Uh, the second was clearly true after a bit. The first, I thought, was not true. Uh, the idea, this is very controversial, but the idea that the civil service is brilliant at policy, I'm not certain is a given, and I was surprised you said you would have nothing to do with that, because it seems to me, unless someone starts saying uh, the policy advice that ministers are getting is not always very good, uh, does not uh, often uh, reflect uh, experience in that area before, um, does not have a proper evaluation of post policies, is actually a very key issue. Well, I, look, I agree with you in that, in that sometimes, uh, well, more often than not, perhaps, the policy formulation is fine, but the, the awareness and understanding of what it actually takes to get it out of the policy and into the implementation is not fine. Uh, and we can have a long debate about you know, front-end loading and, 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 and the, you know, all of that. I mean, I, I agree with you that actually we say, yes, this is fine. I mean, I, I actually, so, so let me give you some examples. I've spent some time with Robert Devereux and the DWP, and I think some of the things that we're trying to do as a government to change behavioural characteristics to either get people back to work after they've been sick or back into work after they've been I think, you know, these are really, really good things to do. You know, they're fantastic ideas. Now, then the question is, how do you go about doing that? Having had that idea, how do we go about doing it? That's where I think we start to fall down. In that case, we happen to have put a commercial interface between us and that behavioural change that we're trying to affect. And now we don't know whether it's the commercial interface or the behavioural change that isn't working right now as quickly as we would like. But, but... There's no question that, you know, the idea in itself, that sounds okay to me, um, but I, I, you know, it's not, um, I, I think it's a, a more realism, I mean, maybe we can bridge ourselves, but maybe there's a realism about, uh, you know, what it takes to get that idea to actually happen. I don't think we do that well. I think, it, I think it's the interesting thing is to look at particular policy areas and do it over, say, a 20-year period. Or if one area I'm interested in, which is kind of technical education, you can look at it over 100 years. Yeah. Uh, the problem was spotted 100 years ago, and you can see one policy innovation after another. Not working. Not working, and no one ever standing back and saying, Well, well that's fair enough. Um, and I think that is an issue. Well, I accept that, and I mean. Something to do with the way the policy process actually takes place. In so I can only, do, me, I'm a simple guy, I just do one thing at a time. Start with delivery, we'll get to the other one. Dave. Thank you. Uh, Dave Penman, General Secretary of uh, the FDA, the Union for uh, Senior Civil Servants and Managers. Um, John, I don't think anyone would disagree with either your analysis of the problem or 
um, the solutions that, that you're pointing to. I just wonder uh, whether, I mean, a lot of what you've talked about is you've got this wonderful phrase about unjoined up uh, government. Um, and, I, and I just wonder, uh, in terms of whether you look at the role of functions, where you talk about how people are managed, how performance will be managed, all of that is going to require government to work together in a way that it hasn't up till now. And that's, I think, going to mean both in terms of organisationally within the civil service and the kind of silo departments, and also in that issue that was touched upon there about the support of ministers in that agenda, when people are saying no minister I, uh, for a particular uh, for a particular reason. So what is I mean, you, ju you said about you know there's a kind of logic to it, and people will just have to, to kind of get it to, to support it. But what really is the solution to that? Because I think that really has been where the civil service has uh, uh, fallen down in delivering the sort of efficiencies and the, the, the large-scale efficiencies that you're talking about or the real uh, step changes in relation to how it works between departments? See, I don't think you can just wish it. Um, I do, th and that's why the functions are so, so key. The only place that you can create I mean, look, it's not by accident that every multinational, multi-product company out there runs with a headquarters which is, has strong central functions. It isn't by accident. It's because it works. It's like a novel concept in Whitehall, it seems to me. And it's really hard. So how do you create? It's not, so, how, so let's take a few examples, right? How do you create... We, we, we have a, uh, you know... We have 23 payment mechanisms across government. And every department has its payment mechanism or it has its registration mechanism. And the problem, the issue is, you know, they're, they're busy doing it. They're doing it every day. Right, right now, we're collecting taxes every day. It's a, it's a payment mechanism into government. We're, they're really, really busy doing it. You can stand over here and you can say, look, uh, you could do this much better, you know, if you just sort of shared it. That's not the issue. We can all see that. Actually, the answer in this case is 90% cheaper, by the way. 90% cheaper, if we did it another way. The issue, of course, is actually how on earth, because I can, you know, I'm doing this seven days a week. I could probably have a conversation with you about that, you know, on Sunday evening at 9 o'clock, because I'm so busy doing this. The issue is, how do you get from here, doing that every day, to some future? If you go to Estonia... You know, you'll know more about this than I, but I'm told Estonia has a wonderfully digital government. Wonderfully efficient, fantastic, you know, and it's brilliant. And the, answer, and the reason, of course, is because it didn't have the old way. It just didn't, I mean, it just built it. And of course you can build it if it's greenfield. The question is, how do you move from here to there? That's the only difficult challenge. It's not defining this, it's how do you move from here to there. What do you need to do that? You need people who understand this bit, and who have experience in this bit. Only those people, that transformative leadership, can create the path from here to there. Because only they can judge the risks that are required. First of all, you've got to have them wanting to get there. You've got to show them this vision. You've got to show them this vision. But you know what? There's nothing like 20 billion pounds of challenge to help. So you set an external challenge, you say, we've got, you know, I, we create that vision, we put big people in here who can actually take those risks and who are prepared to take those risks. It may be that the politicians say, never, you can never take that risk, you've got to keep doing it this way. Keep your 20 billion. Keep your 20 billion because it ain't coming out. It ain't coming out unless you move it. And I think that's the key. Right, um, lots of hands up. I'm going to take you in groups. Um, Kerry, at the front, apart from doing my homework on uh, uh, how Estonia runs its government. That's my next task. Um. <laughs> uh, Andrew Carner, governor here at the Institute and a former civil servant. Um, I wanted to follow up on the interchange between the private sector and the public sector because you said 25% of the senior civil servants already are from the outside. You wanted to see more civil servants go out and come back in. Wholeheartedly agree. I went in and out three times in my career. But it seems to me that the obstacles you face are huge and I wonder how you're going to get over them. Pay is one, because the pay differentials are large. But much more important is the fact that the suspicion always is, if you do go out, somehow or other you're corrupt. 
I mean, just the way the Prime Minister's Advisory Council on Business Appointments works, but the way Parliament looks at civil, service, uh, civil servants moving in and out and the way the media does means that interchange is really difficult. But even more important than that is the culture of the civil service, which fundamentally says, if you leave, you you're a traitor, you betray. That is what the civil service actually Not thinks. Not for you, obviously. But, but they, that is how it still works, and I wonder how you're going to set about changing that. Okay, we'll take a couple of questions. Go ahead. Winnie Agbonlaho from the Global Government Forum. I've got a couple of questions on professions. Um, you were talking about better career paths and you yourself complained about the government's inability to attract and retain talent partly due to pay. Um, and Bill Crothers, the head of the commercial profession, told a select committee hearing that he was confident the commercial profession would soon get the same pay freedoms as D and S, and he said that was being talked about at the top of the shop, i.e. by you and Jeremy Haywood. Um, and then we've can we, got... No, just one question, I'm afraid, because <coughs> so many people have got their hands up. Okay, so, so can you tell us whether that's going to happen and when? <laughs> okay, right. And um, there in the middle, Patrick Jenkins now. I'm joking, I just, I've just retired f after 50 years in Parliament, half of it in the Commons and half of it in the Lords, and of, during which I spent 10 years in government. Um, I, th I, I thought it was significant that the first two questions that came to you, John, were about the political side, and you'd said very little about that in your original talk. Looking at it from the standpoint of those who actually have to try to govern the country as ministers, it seems to me that this is something to which you and no doubt Jeremy Heyman and the rest must really give more attention. There's a very good question asked. How do you, if you get a new government coming in, how do you tell them, the new ministers, what the sort of instrument that they're going to have at their disposal to achieve their policies? Because I think very few of them know about that. You learn it in time, certainly, but you can make an awful lot of mistakes before you do that. Could you say something about that? Thanks, Patrick. Three, three diverse points there, in and out. <laughs> Um, going out, become, being regarded as a traitor, a very point from Winnie on pay and, and the, so the new minister. Let's do it in that order. I mean, the in and out um, uh, um, um, question. I do think, I mean, we have, I think, we, you know, we, we've attracted more people in than we have in the past. Um, uh, my own view on this, I mean, you've just got to sort of start it somehow. I don't actually think the, I think there is a pay issue... Um, as you get more senior. I don't think, as a young person, I think the total value proposition in the civil service is still relatively competitive for quite a while, actually, until perhaps you get into the senior civil service. And so I don't think we have that issue. Um, uh, and I think, we, you know, therefore, if we can get into the habit of it where it isn't an issue, uh, then actually we can, you know, have some interchange that... that uh, um, uh, will help pave the way. I don't, you know, I, how do you change a culture? I, I think you stand in a place, uh, you make it okay that it happens. Uh, it's not by accident, by the way, I'm talking more about delivery than politics, because I think otherwise nobody's talking about, you know, we're talking about politics all the time and nobody's talking about delivery. It's not an accident, it's quite deliberate, because I need to make it okay for people underneath to say, well, actually, somebody's thinking about it, somebody's talking about it, somebody up there has actually spent his 30 years delivering things, not, being a, not, not doing politics, um, uh, and actually, that makes me feel a bit better. And so I talk to people in these terms quite deliberately because of that, actually. Um, uh, fully respectful and knowledgeable that we're in service of the government, of course we are. But actually, we're doing really difficult things, most of which, by the way, outlive most of the governments. Nuclear submarines will outlive most of them. Um, uh, you know, the bridges that we're building, the HS2 that David is looking after, all of these things go right through. And they, I mean, they have to be managed, but most of the things that we do outlive most of the, the political cycles. So there is no question that we have to stand in a place as well to say, actually, you've got to concentrate on that stuff 
um, uh, in the delivery sense. So I'm not sure how you change that culture. I mean, I do, but you know, I would say to you that it's already. My appointment might be one. My appointment might be. I mean, they'll spit. They might spit me out if they do. You know, that'll be the work. That'll then, then you know, then I won't have done it, will I? But I think uh, the key is. Uh, you know, there's a recognition. I think this thing changes, and that's why it's got to be built. Um, it's interesting about the pay issues because um, this is actually quite a difficult problem. I mean, one of the issues with pay is that if you if you sort of it was 450,000 people, uh, you know, one one percent of the pay bill in the civil service 139 million pounds. You can do an awful lot with 139 million pounds if you choose to do it differently. Um, uh, and the question is whether or not there are significant issues um, uh, which are brewing, and I believe that there are, and, and they can be evidenced, where we are having trouble attracting particular skill sets. Uh, commercial is one, actually. And uh, without promising anything, I would say to you that those conversations are taking place. That where we have particular issues of uh, uh, a need. I was talking today to Rupert Soames of Serco. I was talking to him about uh, you know, the relationship between that company and the government. How sophisticated are we as a client? What do we need to do to be a better client to manage that interface even better? Same with all of the companies that we work with. And the fact is we need people on the inside who can play that role. And today we don't always have them. And so we've got to be able to attract them. And I think that that is a clear case. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, it's a, it isn't done yet, but there are certainly conversations which are taking place which give me optimism that it can be done. Sorry? Sorry? I don't know what the details are. Um, uh, you know, DNS have, I don't know, 25 or 30 people, of which they've hired a small minority thus far. Um, uh, there are certainly conversations of exactly the same sort of thing uh, in the commercial space, absolutely. And, and I think that's... So, and coming back to the political thing, of course, I mean, I don't want to be disrespectful in any way because otherwise I will be fired very quickly. Uh, uh, but, but actually, it isn't, it isn't that. Of course, we're here to serve the government. And actually, the issue about um, discussing with, you know, the new lot whenever they show up. I mean, actually, it's quite interesting. So there are already um, some plans, and, and in fact, I think it's happening now. I mean, for instance, the Major Projects Leadership Academy, you know, has a sort of, is starting to uh, offer um, <coughs> different politicians uh, so that they can gain insight into some of the things that it takes to deliver big, complicated projects. So I think we need to do more of that. I think we absolutely need to do more of uh, uh, you, you know, showing politicians some of the things, some of the complexities about the delivery, because I don't, I don't think they always do realise. Actually, I think they do a different job. Right. Um, we've got one last final round of questions. <coughs> one there, um, and two at the, and two at the back. Um, Simon Judge, Department for Education. Um, John, very supportive of all you've been saying. I, I, I spent a lot of time working on a number of these functional strands. Um, four and a half of them, I think, at the latest count. Um, my question is, what, what are your thoughts about getting non-executive directors uh, to be allies uh, in supporting you in, in all of this? Because I'm not sure they always are at the moment. Right, OK. Um, <coughs> at, the, at the back. Uh, Reset of Halvin, the Foreign Office. Um, just a, one, I like the plane metaphor a lot, changing a plane while people are flying. doesn't give a great deal of thought to the passengers, though. A bit disconcerting. Um, so I wonder, just what is, your, what, what is the right appetite for failure? in government, because a lot of the culture change problems comes from a fear of failure. And I don't think the answer should be none, although it's tempting to come back with that as the answer, because I think there's an inherent built-in level of failure that the system does tolerate. But I'd be interested in your thoughts as to whether that should be a greater tolerance of failure, even at a ministerial level. Right. So I should begin by apologising for my outburst. No, 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 no. You, um, you carried on the conversation. <laughs> so my name's Tom Riley. I'm, I'm one of the people that you talk about. I'm actually a senior civil servant on secondment to Shell at the moment where I'm heading up the government relations department. And the thing that has struck me is the attitude to risk. Um, and I know we've touched on it a number of times earlier, and I think it is similar to this point, that politicians are acutely sensitive to their political risk 
and civil servants serving them are therefore by necessity also have to be conscious of that risk. And, and I wonder if you might just explore a little bit how you get across that dichotomy with comfort with risk and with the protection that a senior civil servant can expect from their minister when their minister is exposed publicly. Right, and there's a lady um, who was putting her hand up, yeah, just in front of you, you there. yeah, fine, thanks. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm Kirsty McHugh, I'm Chief Executive of the Employment Related Services Association. I'm the outsider. So my members um, deliver a lot of government contracts amongst other things. Um, and one of the things that we've seen over the last four years, particularly DWP, though not just DWP, is just the impact of churn, um, both the civil servants and at junior ministerial level. To such an extent, in fact, that actually the corporate memory, I think, ends up sitting with the market rather than actually with the, the civil servant. You know, origin, you know, original policy intent is lost, uh, what the background to particular commercial decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And you're right, John, when you say that actually what the market wants more than anything else. Um, is a professional, uh, you know, competent and rational client. Now, it's, I know it's an old chestnut. Ask, but could you ask a question? The question. This is the old, this is the old chestnut. Uh, civil servants, good thing to move people around. From an external perspective, it drives us mad. Is that going to continue? Right. Okay. Um, four final questions for you, Dan. Can I start with the last? Because I feel particularly passionate about this, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, in 2007, there was a refinery in the United States called Texas City, and it blew up one day, and it killed 15 people and injured 275, and it blew their arms and legs off, and it caused all sorts of damage. And in that, I was running, at that time, all of the businesses of BP other than the upstream business. I had five or six or eight businesses. 80,000 people, 120 countries. One of those businesses was the refining business. And uh, the guy in charge of Texas City, which happened to be an old Amaco refinery, where BP had just put it together with Amaco, uh, was an old refiner. And he couldn't speak fancy language, and he couldn't speak to the board, which is where I was sitting at the time. And his boss was also an old refiner. And between his boss and me were three other people. And they were generalists, just like me. And I'm a generalist. And for two years after that incident, my life was transformed by what happened that day in Texas City. And a year after the incident, I went to talk. I mean, of course, I'd been talking to him before, but once all the noise had died down, we had a long, long conversation. And I realized at that time that that individual, and indeed his boss, understood what could happen at Texas City and un understood what was going on in that refinery. And the layers of generalists between me and his boss had not translated that to the top of the shop. And from that experience, I'm a big fan of generalists running big organizations, by the way. The only way you can learn and understand the complexity of a large organization is you have to have spent time all over the place. But w never ever underestimate the experience and expertise that comes from living and breathing a particular system over a lifetime. And I believe BP, and I believe if you'd asked John, he would say the same. I believe we made a mistake because we put too many generalists into the system. And I believe it's the blend of generalists and experts, people who just live and breathe some particular thing, particularly in delivery, and by the way, particularly when you have hydrocarbons under pressure, you need people who just live and breathe it. And they can't speak fancy language, and they can't write erudite papers, and they can't recite the history of the damn thing but they know what's happening. And the mistake never to make is to assume that just because you can conceptualize it on a piece of paper, you actually understand the risks and the trade-offs. And that's my point about generalists and specialists. And I believe we've gone too far. And I believe if we're in the, met, if we're in the business of delivery, we need people with genuine experience. And that's the whole point about putting professions in. So there's your answer 
for that. Okay. Um, and that's why, by the way, I feel so passionate about it, uh, because I've never made that same mistake again. Um, Non-execs, uh, uh, I absolutely think, I, I think most of the non-execs uh, would, would, would sort of resonate with what I've said, because it comes from a corporate world, and most of them come from a corporate world, and, you know, um, so, so what I plan to do, I haven't yet, to be honest, I haven't sort of got to it, uh, what I plan to do is to try to engage them in the conversation, engage them in an agenda. And there's lots of things that they could do, actually. Uh, they could create, uh, they could help the system practice the performance management aspect of what I said. They could leverage networks to bring in some of the expertise about the delivery and just sort of in a coaching sense. They could do a lot of things, actually. And so I, I'm actually optimistic and, and indeed have a dinner with them in the next month. To, to the leads uh, across the system to talk to them about it and sort of talk how about we can ha how we can do that. I think some you know it's it's sometimes it works it's working better and worse across the system that that non-exec thing and so we need to try and help and strengthen that. And I think then back to the sort of attitude to risk, um, the appetite for failure, all of those things. I mean I think that is you know that's actually the crux of this, isn't it? Um, uh, how do you create uh, an environment where, where people are encouraged to take more <coughs> risk where it's appropriate. But you know, and it's, this thing is it's all circular, right? When, when, you, when you really have a sense, uh, because you've been there and you've done it, you're much, much more equipped to take sensible risks. I see a system which is designed to prevent people taking risks. And then, because we don't give people the depth of experience in things, they're not prepared to, t you know, there's no upside in them to take it because actually it's like, a, it's like Russian roulette. You have no real idea because you don't really know. So, and the other thing <coughs> about the civil service is that partly because, uh, and this may be the, poli the political influence, partly because, you know, we need the answer and we need the answer today, we need the answer today. We've got to pause to bed in systemic change. What I'm talking about only comes from deep, deep change. It isn't going to give you an answer tomorrow. And uh, I think we've got to be brave enough to, and hold our nerve enough to bed some of that in. And, um, you know, when we get, if we can... If we can create these functions, these professions, where we have people who have spent longer doing these things, they will have more confidence. They will know what risks to take. They, it won't be such a blind risk. It'll be a well-judged action. Um, and I, you know, so I don't have a complete answer. I think it's at the heart of one of the issues, and we've got to resolve it. Uh, and talking about it is a start. Uh, I mean, you know, and this is where, I mean, you know, love Francis or hate him. Uh, uh, but you know he wanted he, he he presented the award the best failure or something in the in the awards you know, I mean he's got the right idea right? I mean he wanted to call it the failure award and everybody said oh you can't do that you know, uh, uh, but actually it's the right idea it's speaking to what you're talking about so we need to encourage it's not it's not about failure but it's about um, taking risk. Just one final question for me, what time scale are you giving yourself, John? On, on well, till they fire me basically, yeah. but five years I think. Mean. Five years, five years. Could I, this has been absolutely fascinating, um, 75 minutes. My apologies to those who haven't got in with questions. We, 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 I took a lot of questions in, um, and it's been a, a, very stimulating. I'm almost going to use the word candid, um, but that, that, that would be Heaven too damning. That, that might shorten <laughs> the five years. Um, <laughs> um, exchange, I'm, I'm very grateful to you for answering the questions so openly, covering such a wide range. Um, we will be following very closely at the Institute for Government. Many of the things um, um, you've uh, suggested we are strongly supportive of, particularly strengthening the functional leadership of the professions. We've done quite a lot of work on that. We look forward to carrying on um, working on that with you over the next few years. So could you join me in the audience in thanking uh, John and Donnie very much indeed. <laughs>